I guess, Robert, you want to give the grades out. So that's a good way of going through every event. So let's start with Josh Kerr. I'm assuming Josh Kerr, I would give him an A, if not an A+. I mean, this guy was incredible. Like, think about what he did, all right? End of November, he's announced as headlining the two-mile. And he calls his shot right then. He says, I'm going for the world record. 803.40 by Mo Farah from 2015. That equates to around a... 727 for 3,000 meters. So it's a pretty lofty goal. And Josh also doesn't know, like, he's saying, I'm going to break the world record on February 11th. He's saying this in November when he actually doesn't really know how his next two months of training is going to go. So he calls out his world record shot. It gets people talking about the race. A bunch of other good guys join the race. Grant Fisher is one of them. Hands on Grant Fisher for 3,000, almost 3,000 meters. And runs 8 flat point six seven, which is a fantastic time. Much faster than when he ran in this race last year. He ran 7.33 here last year. I was like, 8.03? That's a little aggressive? Turns out he knew what he was talking about. Called a shot two months out and delivered. I, I think I think that's an A-plus in my book, Robert. Great minds think alike. Alike. Because it's equivalent to 7.24.90 for 3,000. I mean, the 7.33 last year shocked us. And now he's another almost 10 seconds faster than that. So uh, I wrote a plus. I said, yes, he's not close. Some people are saying it's not close to what to Jakob's almost unfathomable 754.1 that he ran this summer, last summer. But I said, Kerr's never going to be as fit or as a healthy Ingerbritson. The goal is to be fit enough that you can hang with him when you're benefiting from a second O lap of drafting off of him and then now kick him like he didn't do to Budapest. So this was a great performance for him. A plus Grant Fisher, the runner up. He led this race for basically 29 for all but the final 300, basically got destroyed in the final 300. And I'm not going to lie. Well, I don't want to, I don't want to balance. I don't want to bias you, John. What type of grade do you think Grant Fisher deserves? Well, I, I will buy two. I'll say as a fan, as an American fan, watching Fisher get destroyed by almost three full seconds over the final 300 meters was kind of depressing. I wasn't the only one. It made some question if Fisher will ever win a big race. Well, I can't give him anything lower than an A-. minus. He ran 803.62. He missed the old record by a tenth of a second. This is his first race under his new coach. Clearly, he's still very fit. He smashed the American record. And the guy he lost to is the reigning world champion in the 1500 who drafted off him the whole time. And I'm I'm not faulting Josh Kerr for that. I think it's the smart thing to do. But I I think it's an A minus or an A. Like this was really good. And I like what you you want Grant Fisher to outkick the reigning 1500 meter world champion. He's never been like the most amazing kicker to begin with. So I, I think you have to. I think it's an A for me. I gave him an A minus, and I said giving Fisher a B plus would be an injustice. If Kerr, think about it this way: if Kerr wasn't in this race, Let's Run would be raving, absolutely raving about the gunsy front running Fisher who sold himself to a world record and dominant two plus second victory in a race that would have made Steve Prefontaine proud. Also, Fisher ended up being the world's greatest rabbit and sent the fans home proud because they got to see a world record. So. Yeah, A minus or A, no doubt. But I did post on the message board. I was like, man, maybe he should have just tried to sit on Kerr. I mean, I know the whole point is to get the record. People have been mad. But I'm like, he's got to work on his kick. He's never going to be able to just blast people. He's never going to run away from the field, the 5,000, right? So I mean, he, he's going to work on his speed. People are like, come on, dude, trying to outkick the world 1,500 champion is stupid. I'm like, well, no, that's what he's got to get better at. I've rethought that. I think actually the best way to get a better kick is to get in better shape. If you're just less tired at the end of the race, then you have a better kick. So I do think him grinding the pace, this is what he needs for the 10,000, which is coming up. I think it's absurd that he has to run the 10,000 to get a qualifier. Like they, the World Athletics should be rewarding this guy, you know, sending him to world cross country and give him the 10,000 qualifier. But- yeah, I think the, the thing about Grant is... I look at someone like, do I think Barrega has more pure speed than Grant Fisher? Probably. Does Jakob Ingebrigtsen, another one of his threats in the 5,000? Yes. 
But I also think, yeah, if he like can Grant Fisher run a fifty-two second four hundred meters, of course he can. And his, like you said, Robert, I think it is just about getting strong enough to where he's able to do that at the end of the race, particularly in a in a ten thousand, um, which has been historically his more successful event on the global stage. So I don't th- like. I wouldn't call Grant Fisher a kicker. I'm not sure. But I don't think he needs to be necessarily to to earn a medal in the 5,000 or especially the 10,000. He needs to be at the bell feeling good and ready to close, you know, feeling strong enough to close in 52 or 53 high. Uh, oh, sorry, 52 or 53. And I, I think he's, I think he can do that. This is crazy good running all the way around. Josh Kerr can run 724 for 3K. That's the conversion. I mean, last year, like you said, John, we thought, what, 733 was good for him? This has started to make, make me, you know, I'm like, wow, is Josh essentially like Jakob? I mean, does Jakob need to be getting worried? But then somebody pointed out, like, there's comments on the YouTube. They're like, Jakob ran 754.10 last year. Granted, it was outdoors. But that's better than Coleman 720 when you convert it. It converts to 718. So also the shoes. Like, let, let's get there. The times don't mean what they used to mean. Anything sub 725 used to be like, there weren't any sub 725s essentially. And now they're sort of every year we're, we're seeing them. It was Coleman El Garouche. I think that was it. And now Josh Kerr is in the club. But... Still, big picture. I don't care if there's this was a downhill track at Milrose. Josh Kerr just took down Grant Fisher at a two mile. He's way better than he was last year. He's delivering on the promise. He's hungry. Like, look out. The guy looks like a different runner. You know, like, it's, you know, the, the, I expect him now to challenge Jakob Ingebrigtsen. I don't expect him to win. But I expect it to be a damn good challenge. No, this was, a, I think this was a big deal. And if, look, Jakob Ingebrigtsen, I don't think gets sort of scared of that sort of thing. But if I was in his shoes, I'd be worried by this result because I'd be like, wait a minute, this guy is now even stronger aerobically than he was last year. Um, because the whole thing is like Ingebrigtsen, he's banking on if he uses the strategies used the last couple of finals, being stronger aerobically that he can just drop everyone. And then a kick doesn't really factor in it into it because he's already broken everyone or they're kicking when they're tired in a 1500 final. And if Josh Kerr, now granted he had a lot of advantages, you know, you get super spikes that everyone has, but he also had Grant Fisher rabbiting him essentially for the entire second half, which Jakob did not have that when he ran his two miles. But all that is to say like, you know, you look at Ingebrigtsen, and it's like, damn, this guy's going to be even harder to drop than he was before. And <laughs> that's not a good thing. It makes the race more exciting. But I don't know. I'm really interested in, Robert, maybe this is the time we bring up this article you dug up. It was from last week, but it had some quotes about Ingebrigtsen and his approach to the 1500 and whether it, you know, continue to run from the front even after getting beat. I thought this was fascinating uh, stuff from what Jakob Ingebrigtsen had to say. If if you missed it, essentially, he was asked by a couple of Norwegian media outlets, you know, will you continue to run from the front? And then th- this was an exchange. I'm quoting from VG here. They said, he, you know, it is something very few have managed. And the day I have managed to do it, you are not only the best. It is quite obvious that you have exposed yourself to much more than everyone else. And yet you win. That was running a 1500 meter global final from the front and leading the whole thing wire to wire and winning. But then, some, you know, he's tried this in the last three global finals he's been in, World Indoors 2022, World in- Outdoors 2022, World Outdoors 2023. He's gotten beaten all of them. So the question was put to him, and I love the translation here, but is it pure idiocy to do it in such a way rather than a cheaper way? And Jakob's response, I think the reason why so few have succeeded is that they are not capable of it. And the reason more people don't try is because they don't have enough balls. It's a delicate balance between idiocy and doing something unique. And part of me loves this. I'm like, all right, he's just trying to do it in the hardest way possible and win. I, I like it. But I'm part of, the other part of me is like, 
is he doing it because he's got more balls than these guys, or is he doing it because he knows his kick isn't quite good and this is how he has to do it in order to win? What do you guys make of this exchange? How did I miss this quote? How is this not quote of the day? This is unbelievable stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure, John, he thinks he can win if he tries it another way. But also trying it his way still takes a lot of balls. No doubt that. I, I won't, I'll give him respect. That is a hard thing to do, and I have a lot of respect for him. Because most milers, no matter how bad their kick is, and I'm not saying he's a bad kick, but there's questions about it. They think they'll oh, kick everyone at the end. He's never even tried it. He's never tried it. Right? Well, 2021 Olympic final, he kind of got into second and sat on Chariot. So that was that wasn't a kicker's race. He ran 328, but yeah, he hasn't been like, oh, I'll just come from way behind, you know, in a global final. Well, there was another aspect to this quote. We'll link to this thread, the links to the articles in the show notes. The others are just trying to have a good race and beat each other. I don't just want to win. I want to win overwhelmingly. Now, as I point out, look, he doesn't front run the 5,000. He sits and kicks on people. Now, someone says that Inger Bitsen's acknowledged that. He says he would like to front run the 5,000. But it's interesting. Walden asked if Kerr was another Inger Bitsen. No, I think he's a hybrid of, of Inger Bitsen and Whiteman. I mean, Kerr's endurance, I mean, come on. He would get destroyed in a world-class 5,000. Whereas Inger Bitsen seems almost unbeatable in that. But you know, and he, but he's, he's, Kerr's not a real speedy guy. His 800 meter PB is only a second faster than Ingerbridge. It's like 145 versus 146. Whereas, you know, Whiteman is a 143 guy. Centrowitz, who famously won Olympics from the front, but in the slow race, is a 144 guy. So I, I it's just it's what makes the event so fascinating. The fifteen hundred, we know who's going to be there. It's short enough; no one's going to get dropped. But well, I guess he's trying to break everybody. I was, I've been asking John Kellogg in the office, like, if we were coaching him, what would we tell him to do? And John's like, well, normally in the fifteen hundred, it doesn't even matter if it's slow. It's like normally it's just they can still finish in the same order of their personal best, because the speed doesn't matter that much. So people are a little bit less tired. But I'm like, well, you don't. I don't. I don't know, man. I wouldn't jog around, but. I actually think, I don't know. I was telling John on the phone today, like, what if Inga Brinson doesn't push the pace? Let somebody else push it for a lap or two. Let Kip Sang push it. Let Nagoose push it. I don't think Nagoose wants it to go out in 63 or something like that and then take over. Or you could actually, I think there was something to be learned from Nagoose's race in Milrose today. They went out super fast, like 152, but then they ran like a 59.8. Like they basically ran 60. And these two guys were sitting on the goose. I'm like, oh my God, he's going to get out kicked. And no, he closes in like 26 and just runs away from them. So Jakob could also go out hard and then rest and then try to outkick, you know, like um, Kerr. I, I don't think Kerr's speed is so much greater than Ingebrigtsen that he doesn't have a chance. Like if he just sits on Kerr and tried to outkick him. Now he, he's never done that. And they don't get that many chances to, to practice it. But, you know, it, it, it's pretty interesting. So. Let's talk about the, the the we don't want to make a whole another whole another podcast about Ingebrigtsen. Men's mile. What Robert, I do think if we tried to kick out, we just said, here's our weekly 15 minute Jakob Ingebrigtsen podcast. People would li- I actually think people would listen to that, especially if he's just going to be this quotes gold mine that he's been during the entire off season. Like this has been the most amazing 1500 meter off season we've had in years between Ingebrigtsen and Kerr. And I actually love it. Kerr Kerr is even like, hey. I just say these things and, you know, you put me in front of a joke. He essentially said, like, Whiteman had an interview last week and you put us in front of a microphone for an hour. At some point, we're probably going to let our guard down and say something interesting. And then people get headlines. But he's all for it. He's not, like, complaining, oh, you guys, you're taking this massively out of context. You're drumming up some controversy. He's kind of understands some of its a little, you know, out of control media hype. But he's also like, look, I'm... I like it when people get excited about the sport. I like that people are talking about my events. This is good for me. It's good for my sponsors. He's all for it. So I commend him for that. And I think he, he has helped make the sport more inter- interesting uh, between what him and Ingebrigtsen have been saying this offseason. Well, there's another guy that hopes to be in the mix this summer. American Yard Nagoose. 